thank you for joining us again for this study of the biblical worldview. And what I mean by that is, like we discussed in the previous episode, this recognition that while the Bible is not one individual book, it is many books and letters in numerous different genres of literature, numerous different authors written in multiple locations, multiple languages, and multiple cultures, it has all been collected together and orchestrated through history to tell God's great love story. So when we left off yesterday in our previous session, we were talking about how we're calling this the greatest love story never told. And we discussed how for a variety of different reasons, from ignorance to busyness to fear, we don't talk about the overarching story the Bible tells of God's great love for us and how God wants everyone to come home to his family. So I call this the greatest love story never told because we don't talk about these things. We're so caught up in the minutia of the basics of the faith for our young and maturing believers, but we also never really spend time investing in the deeper truths. And as a result, what ends up happening is there are these gaps in our theology and our beliefs, whether that's doctrine, practices, whatever, that we're left either saying we don't know, or we try to fill in those gaps with hearsay or what our current culture says. So let's pick up where we left off. Last time, as a quick review, we talked about the beginning, how God's original design for creation was for his heavenly family and his earthly family to work together for the supernatural spiritual beings that exist in the heavens outside of the physical world to live together in harmony by connecting the heavens with the earth and the heavenly family and the earthly family would live together connecting in Eden. And we talked about how Eden was not just a garden. It was also the mountain of God. It was where God had his throne. And then as human beings were supposed to you know, continue to operate in the family, that was God's original vehicle for the faith was the family. That a husband would leave his family, join with his wife, and create a new family that the human race would fill the earth and govern it. That we would image God here on earth the way his heavenly family images him in the heavens. That both families would rule and reign over our set location. And God did this not because he needed to. Other religious systems, other faith beliefs, make their gods um, to where they need human beings. You know, one of the great teachings in the Greco-Roman mindset is that the gods need the worship of human beings to thrive and survive, that they feed off of it. Well, the true God, our God, does not need anything, but he wants relationships. And that's what we have to recognize is that while God does not need anything, he has created orders and he has created ways of operation in order to provide for us. For example, we talked about how in the beginning God created an area in Eden where he had his throne and God had thrown guardians. We know that from numerous situations where human beings see into the heavens where God's throne room is. And we talked about how Ezekiel referred to Lucifer in Eden when he was talking to the king of Tyre, but he was retelling an ancient story that had been passed down about what happened when Lucifer, you know, took, you know, his own will and said, I want my will more than God's will. And he tricked and deceived human beings. Well, that's what we're talking about with the rebellion. But before then, Lucifer was an a throne guardian of God. Does God need throne guardians? No, but this was created as a model for humans to follow in their own earthly kingdoms. And so we even see in glimpses where there are layers to the authority and power of the heavenly beings as well. So after God created everything in perfection with the heavenly family and the earthly family co-mingling and connecting in Eden, rebellions started to happen. 
we know that somewhere along the way that Lucifer rebelled against God and planted the seeds of distrust in Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, as we talked about in our last session, could not deny the power of God. They could not deny the divinity of God or his omniscience, omnipresence, all these things. God, God has all the power, all the authority, and all of the command over everything. So Lucifer planted seeds of distrust, and we talked about how Eden and the, and the forbidden fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, had nothing to do with fruit. It was all about truth. Did God really say? Is God really trustworthy? Can you put your trust in his will for your life? And that is the seed of distrust that is planted in every human heart ever since, is that God is not trustworthy. And so we discussed how there were three rebellions. Adam and Eve rebel against God by taking their own will and doing the, what they want over what God wants. And even though God said, if you eat this fruit, you'll surely die. Lucifer planted that seed in their heart and said, no, you won't die. God's only told you that because he knows you'll be like him. They believed a lie. They were already like him in their image. And we talked about that, that human beings are not equal with God. But it's this idea that we represent God and he's delegated authority to us. So Adam and Eve were already made in God's image. They were already like him in many ways, in many aspects. But Satan appeal to their selfishness and said, you can do it without God. And so Adam and Eve rebelled and the consequence was death. But we get confused about this because in God's economy, death is not physical death. That's a component of it. But the essence of death in God's economy is separation from him. And the moment Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they experienced a separation from him. They experienced death. That's why when the book of Revelation refers to the judgment at the end of the world, when God makes a new heaven and new earth, that the, those who did not want a relationship with God will experience the second death. Well, it is, that doesn't mean they physically die and then spiritually die. It means that they are separated from God in their earthly life by refusing to have relationship with him. So they will be separated for him for eternity for not wanting that connection. So after Adam and Eve rebel and are kicked out of Eden and suffer the consequences of their actions, we saw how the heavenly beings rebelled. Not all of them, but many of them chose to leave their appointed place in heaven and to come down to the earth and to intermingle and intermarry with human beings and have children with them. And this rebellion led to the you know, creation of the Nephilim, also referred to as the Raphaim or the Anakim in different parts of what we call the Old Testament and in the extra biblical writings of the Book of the Giants, the Book of the Watchers, the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch. All of these refer to the giants as the children of or heavenly beings and earthly beings. And it's fascinating how if you study the lore and the mythology of ancient cultures and civilizations, they all tell the same story, just in a different way, of these demigods that do amazing things and have you know, incredible power to do things. And, and the story is in every civilization that these giants came and gave the gift of civilization and technology and warfare to civilization, to human beings in different parts of the world. And so the heavenly beings rebel after the flood and they say you know what we're we're going to um you know have all these you know um you know children with human beings or excuse me before the flood and then after the flood we get to the third rebellion which is the human beings rebel again so adam and eve rebel but now humanity rebels after the flood they distrust God and they build a temple and say, we refuse to obey God's directive to fill the earth. We do not want to be scattered. We want to stay together as one people. And so they build a tower. Now, we don't know what the tower is for. We discussed this in our previous time. But just as a review, the ancient writings of the time by the Jewish you know, writers was that this tower was built because the people did not want to die in the flood again. And that the, the tower was tall enough that they would be able to climb to the top and survive. And so they rebelled against God. And maybe there was an essence of pagan worship. We don't know. But what we do know is this was a state of rebellion 
against God. And so God confuses the languages of the people and scatters them throughout the world. That's where we left off last time. So we've covered chapter 1, the beginning, chapter 2, the rebellions. Now let's look at chapter 3. We call this the divine council. Now, it's important to recognize that God has a lot to say about things that we don't have a lot to say about. These are certain things that we have kind of lost along the way because they don't matter in our current culture. This idea of you know, a multiplicity of heavenly beings has been taken to an extreme. There are people that focus so much on angelology, demonology, the supernatural, the occult, you know, divination, tarot, fortune telling, that scares people. And so we run from one extreme to the other. We, in order to stay away from the extreme of the occult, we run away from anything that is a reference or a connection to that. And so as a result, we, we, we just ignore it and we never talk about it. But the Bible is full of examples and teachings about the people that live in the unseen world, the heavenly beings. And so we're going to talk about that today. And we call those heavenly beings that, that operate under God's authority as the Elohim. And members of the Elohim serve under what's called God's divine counsel. Why does this matter? Because what we see is that God creates a model. One of the things that we recognize as we study the scripture is that God created everything in perfection, but in his omniscience, he knew what would happen. The moment God created people, he did that knowing that there would be a rebellion. He created heavenly beings knowing there would be a rebellion. And so God makes a way. If you read, uh, we skipped over it, but right before God makes the Adamic covenant with Adam and Eve, he tells Lucifer that you will bite the heel of mankind and mankind will step on your head and crush you. And that was a pointing to the day where Lucifer as this, this wily, you know, you know, sly person is going to try and take the heel. That's a wrestling move to defeat someone. You grab them by the heel and you pull them out from under and you let them fall on their back. That he would deceive them and trick them and, and, and throw them down. And God said, no, one day they're actually going to crush your head. And so God creates patterns in preparation for the future. God knew that there would be earthly kings and that earthly kings would need advisors to make wise decisions. And so God creates a model for this. This picture is a stele of a Sumerian king. I've, I've circled him in red. That's the king. And if you don't know anything about how to read these cultural things, you can look at the fact that he's carrying the largest staff and he's wearing the grandest robe. That should be a key. But this is an ancient Sumerian stele of a king surrounded by his court, by his advisors. And God actually does the same thing. We see in numerous passages, and I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to give you a few key examples. We see in the scriptures that God is surrounded with a heavenly court, a heavenly council. We call them the divine council, that God seeks their advice. He ask their opinion, not because he needs it, but he does it as a model for us. That's the same thing we have to recognize is that God needs nothing from anyone. There's community in the Trinity. God's never lonely. God is never hungry. God has no needs that we can supply. But he wants relationship, and so he seeks that through human beings and heavenly beings and surrounds himself with a community. So where do we see some of this? Well, one of the greatest examples we see is in Psalm 82. It says God presides over what? Over heaven's court, and he pronounces judgment on the heavenly beings. Now, why would God need to pronounce judgment on them? Why would God need a heavenly court? Like I said, we don't talk about this, but this is known as what is called the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And I've mentioned him numerous times, but I am deeply indebted to the, to the late Dr. Michael Heiser, who passed away a few years ago. But his writings on the Divine Council, his writing on his, his books, The Unseen Realm, Supernatural, Angels and Demons, his writings have been hugely influential and incredibly powerful in my life because these were things that I was never taught in church never taught in Sunday school, and in all of the years of Bible college and seminary up to a doctoral level, nobody taught me this stuff. 
I had to learn it from other sources. So thank God for people like Dr. Heiser who are teaching these things to fill in the gaps, to explain what this means when you read these passages in the Bible. Why would God need a heavenly court? Why would God choose to operate that way? Well, we have to go back to Deuteronomy 32. Now, remember all of the rebellions we've talked about. Those play a key role. Look at what Moses writes to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy is, is a book of speeches that were collected, things that Moses said to the people to teach them and to instruct them. So look at what Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, starting in verse 7. Remember the days of long ago. Think about the generations past. Ask your father and he will inform you. Inquire of your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race. Now, I've highlighted that because this is important. When did God divide up the human race? When they rebelled at Babel. If you go back into Genesis 6 and you read the Tower of Babel account, you see that God did this to scatter the people over the earth, and he divided them into different races and languages. So this is referring back to the rebellion at Babel. Look at what it goes on to say. He established the boundaries of the people according to the number of his heavenly court. Now, some translations, you refer to the, um, you know, the, the um, Septuagint to get the translation for this. Well, we have more ancient, more accurate translations preceding, predating the Septuagint called the Masoretic Text and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these writings show us that, that the idea of translating this had been messed up. See, other translations would say that God divided the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. Now, they changed that because they didn't know what to do with this idea of a heavenly cord, but Israel did not exist at Babel. So there's nothing for God to, to divide up. But what we see is that God does divide them up according to his heavenly court. Why would God divide the nations? Well, if you believe what the Bible teaches as well as what the extra biblical historical sources teach about what the ancient Jews believed, that when human beings were created, God gave the heavenly beings reign over the heavens and the earthly beings, Adam and Eve, and their children, their descendants were meant to rule over the earth and govern it. But when human beings rebelled against God, according to Deuteronomy 32, he delegated that authority to the number of his heavenly court. Now, this is what we call cosmic geography, that just as a king delegates portions of his kingdom to the members of his court and makes them governors over those territories, God does that originally for human beings, but when human beings fail and begin to be selfish, God says, okay, heavenly beings, I'm going to assign you to them. And if you look, this is the original table of nations. As we look at the descendants of Adam, that Adam goes you know, and eventually leads to Noah, and Noah's children spread throughout the world and create, after the flood, the table of nations. Now, the idea is that for every one of these 72 nations that are on this chart, there would be a heavenly being over them that is meant to lead them to God, to govern them, to give them guidance and direction. This is why it makes sense that in all these different cultures throughout the world that a heavenly being would visit them, give them truth, give them technology, give them civilization. That's recorded in numerous cultures from the Mesoamerican cultures to the ancient Middle Eastern cultures to the African cultures, the Asian cultures, all throughout the world. Ancient cultures say that somewhere along the way, a divine being visited them who looked like a human but was not, who had supernatural powers and knowledge and gave them to the people. Think about Prometheus bringing fire. Think about Maui drawing up the islands of the Polynesian nations out of the water. Right? Think about you know the Epic of Gilgamesh, all these amazing people that were able to, and I can never say his name right, Quetzalcoatl in the Mesoamericans, I actually did it right that time. But all of these people and these different groups of nations throughout history have told a similar version of the same story. Where would this come from? This idea that God assigned the nations to his heavenly court. We see this in the, in the book of Job as well. 
that God sits down with his divine counsel. It says this in Job chapter 1. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord. And God brags to them on Job and says, have you considered my servant Job? And so the divine counsel said, we see this in numerous places about God meeting with his heavenly representatives that have authority over the earth. And they rule and reign. But what does this have to do? Well, let's look at what the Bible also says. Let's go back to Psalm 82 again. We read this verse before. God presides over heaven's court. He pronounces judgment on the heavenly beings. Why would God need to pronounce judgment on the heavenly beings? Well, it goes on to tell us. He says this, how long will you, and I underline the word you, because whenever you read the, the Bible, you should always ask the question, who is you? You should do that with any book, really. But if you're trying to say, who does this apply to? Who is God talking to? Who is the you here? Well, we just read it. It's the heavenly court, the divine council. How long will you, divine council, hand down unjust decisions by favoring the wicked? He tells them this, give justice to the poor and the orphan, uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute, rescue the poor and helpless, deliver them from the grasp of evil people. Why would God need to tell them to do this? Because they were doing the opposite. They were leading the people in wickedness. And we see that throughout history and in the extra biblical writings. The story of Humanity is that heavenly beings came down and led the people to idolatry, to worship them instead of the one true God. Have you ever wondered why these people would so devoutly worship these other pagan gods? Did they just make them up? No, they actually had, if we believe the Bible and the extra biblical sources that the Bible writers believed, this is what history tells us, that these heavenly beings set themselves up as gods, and they led the people to do evil things, taught them warfare, taught them how to you know, build these great monuments like the pyramids. Have you noticed that there are pyramids all over the world in different shapes and fashion, but they go up to create this mountainous shape into the heavens because they focused on the stars. The ancients believed that the gods lived in the heavens, and in, in that's what the stars were. And so that's what they led them to worship, this pagan idolatry, and to do evil, wicked things. It says, but these oppressors, I underline that because remember, who is you? This is the divine council, the heavenly beings in charge of the planet. These oppressors know nothing. They are so ignorant. They wander about in darkness while the whole world is shaken to the core. They're so caught up, according to this passage, in doing what they want, they're they're distracted from what's really happening. But look at what God says. I say you are gods. You are all children of the Most High. Now we're going to talk more about this in a minute, but this word gods here is lowercase g. It's the word Elohim. He's not, he's not talking to heavenly beings He's talk, or to earthly beings. He is talking to heavenly beings. He said, you are all gods, or you are gods, you are all children of the Most High. When you read in the Bible, when you hear the phrase sons of God, that is referring to the heavenly beings until you get to the New Testament and the New Covenant where Paul says God gives human beings the honor of being called sons of God. But before that, it always refers to these heavenly beings. You're all children of the Most High. He says, but you will die like mere mortals and fall like every other ruler. You see, we get more context keys. Number one, if, they're, if this is talking about human beings, why does God need to tell them you're going to die like more, mere mortals? Because they're already mortals. Of course they're going to die. No, God is talking to the heavenly beings and saying, as punishment for not leading the people well, you are going to die like human beings. That means you're not going to live forever because these are heavenly beings. They don't, they don't have physical death like human beings do. You'll die like mere mortals and fall like every other ruler. He's saying to them, you're going to lose your authority and you're going to have that taken away. God gave these heavenly beings authority and they did not use it well. They led the people to do evil to be wicked, to turn their back on the one true capital G, God. And so Elohim are, are 
all throughout the Bible. Think about some of these amazing times where the unseen world interacts with the seen world. Think about when Elisha is surrounded by armies to take him captive and his servants freaking out and he says to his servant there's more on our side than there are on theirs and he prays to God open his eyes so he can see now Elisha doesn't pray that prayer because his servant is blind physically he just cannot see the spiritual world and it says that then his eyes were opened and he saw the armies of heaven in the supernatural world that there is this unseen world when Daniel is visited by angels like Gabriel or the one who comes that's unnamed who tells him look it took me 21 days to come to you because I was fighting the spirit prince of Tyre you see there are spiritual beings put in charge of the nations but since Israel is a separate nation it did not get one of these pagan gods over it Instead, Michael, the archangel, is placed over Israel. And that's what he actually says, that your spirit prince, he tells Daniel, is Michael. So we see a problem. Human beings and heavenly beings have rebelled. God puts his divine counsel in charge of the planet, and they lead people to rebel as well, to worship them as gods rather than worshiping the one true God. So what does God do about that? Well, he creates the plan. He creates the plan. God wants to put a plan into place to redeem not just human beings, but also his heavenly beings to bring his family back together. How does God do that? He does it through covenants. Now, throughout the Bible, there are seven major covenants that God creates with people. The first is the Adamic covenant. We mentioned that briefly earlier. After Adam and Eve rebel against God, God tells them, look, before life was easy. You didn't have to work hard to get food and you didn't have to work hard in childbirth. But now, oh, it's going to be difficult. The earth is not going to be easy to work to get food. And hey, Eve, when you have children, it's going to be painful. Now, we don't know exactly what the world was like before the fall of humanity and that first great rebellion, but we know it had to be a whole lot better than it is now. And so Adam is promised that not only will it be hard to get food, he also says, hey, now you're not going to live forever. God cut them off from the tree of life and said, now you're going to die eventually, physically. You're going to go back to the dust you were created out of. As time goes on, people become wicked and God decides to kill everyone except for one righteous family, Noah's family. And after the flood, God makes the Noahic covenant, the Noahic covenant. And that's the never to destroy the earth again with water. So we never have to worry about the earth being destroyed with water again. Then God creates another covenant because all of the nations of the earth have been assigned a heavenly being of the divine council who has led them away from God. He says, look, I got to create another nation. These 72 nations that have grown and developed into other nations over time have all rebelled against me. And I need a new nation that has not been tainted by pagan idolatry and worship. And he calls a man named Abraham. It's actually his name is Abram first. And he promises Abraham that through you, I'm going to make a new nation that will bless all of the world. Now, why did God choose Abraham? Because when God does things, he wants to make sure that people know he did it. And he, so he, he makes a plan that only he can get the credit for. Abraham and Sarah were so old, they could not have children and they had not been able to have any children up until then. So in their old age, at the age of 100, they have children. That's physically impossible for a 100-year-old person to have a child. But with God, all things are possible. God creates a new nation only he can get the credit for, and he does that with Abraham. But a nation needs territory. In order for a nation to exist, there has to be property. And so God makes a promise not only that to Abraham, that not only would he be a great nation, he recommits this promise multiple times to the descendants of Abraham to tell them, I'm going to give you this land and called it the promised land. Now, God does two things in the Palestinian covenant. He makes a territory for 
his people to have so they can be their own nation. But then he also brings judgment on the Nephilim. If you study the book of Joshua, there's a really interesting and, and actually kind of sad passage where God tells Joshua to go into the promised land, and in some nations he says to drive them out. But in most of the nations he says to kill them all. And that sounds really harsh until you put it in context that this is the Nephilim. This is the children of this unholy union. And God recognizes that these giants are not only an unholy union between heavenly beings and earthly beings, they also are leading the people into evil. When you look at the histories of the world, numerous cultures talk about giants that help them build the pagan temples and give them knowledge of warfare and destruction. Why? Because they're old. They've been around for a long time. They're big. They can help them build these things. If you study a lot of these ancient monoliths and megalithic structures that were impossible for human beings to make on their own, they had to have help. And the Bible gives us the explanation that it's these Nephilim that do that. And so God brings judgment on the Nephilim by killing them all and taking the land that they had. This also explains, the Bible doesn't teach this, but the extra biblical accounts, especially in the book of the giants, explains that because the giants, the Nephilim, were not the natural sanctioned union that God meant for human beings to have with each other, that when the giants, when the Nephilim were killed, their spirits had nowhere to go. When human beings die, their spirits go into Sheol, into the grave, to rest and wait for God to set things right again. But the spirits of these unholy unions, the Nephilim, the giants, have nowhere to go. So they wander the earth looking for bodies to replace the ones that, that they lost when they died. And so this explains why these evil spirits that we call demons, the Shadim in the Hebrew, that's why they want bodies, because they lost their bodies along the way. And that explains so much about why evil spirits, why do demons want to possess human beings? Because they want bodies. So all of this makes sense. And so God promises to give this land, and it's a double whammy. It gives the nation of Israel territory to be a true nation, and it also brings judgment on the Nephilim, also called the Raphaim or the Anakim. Then after the Palestinian covenant, God meets with a guy named Moses. And he makes Moses a promise, a covenant, to make the people of Israel the, the nation that would restore humanity. That God gives through Moses the law. The, Mos the law of Moses has 613 commands. And there's three types of commands. People get kind of messed up with this. Normally we think of the Ten Commandments. But there's 613 commandments. And God gives three types of rules in the law of Moses. Civic laws. Because the nation of Israel is a nation. The law of Moses was their constitution, their bill of rights, their legal codes, civic laws. He also gave them ceremonial laws, how to worship God, how to enter into God's sacred space. That's the reason why Adam and Eve had to be kicked out of the garden. Because they were no longer fit for sacred space because of their sin and their selfishness. That's why the tabernacle and the temple were modeled after the Eden situation, where they had to have experienced death outside of the temple or the tabernacle to atone and be made right with God, to be fit for sacred space, to enter into God's presence inside the tabernacle or the temple. That there are three layers to represent the way the world used to be, the outside world of the earth, the first layer of Eden, and then the third layer, the inner layer of the Garden of Eden where God's throne was. That's why there was the outer courtyard representing the world, the the holy place, the, the holy area where the sacrifices of the, the showbread and the grain offerings and the incense burner and the, the light of God's presence of the, of the big menorah, the lampstand. And then there was the innermost part of the temple, the holy of holies that represents God's throne room. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was that represents God's presence. You see how all this is modeled? And so the Mosaic Covenant gave people ceremonial laws and then it gave them moral laws like honor your father and mother. Don't lie, don't steal, only worship one God. So this was the Mosaic Covenant. But 
that doesn't stop there, that as the people take the promised land, they reject God and they want a king. And God says, okay, if you want a king, I'll use that. And he makes a covenant with the king of David, that Israel, the king David, king of Israel, that there will always be a descendant of David on the throne. And he does this so that the Messiah could come, the Savior could come, Jesus the Christ could come through the line of David. And then in numerous places in what we call the Old Testament, and then of course Jesus teaches this and the New Testament teaches this, that God needed to make a new covenant. The Old Covenant took care of the Jewish people to lead them to this point where we have the New Covenant. And we're going to talk about what the point of the New Covenant is eventually, but the goal of the New Covenant is so that all people can be part of God's family. Each of these covenants is important, and one leads to the other. Hopefully you see that. And now all of the other covenants have passed away because they've all been fulfilled in Jesus, and now we are under his New Covenant. Why did God do that? Because he wanted to bring everybody back home. But to do this, God had to create a faint. Not like, oh, pass out, but a faint, F-E-I-N-T. If you know anything about boxing or fighting or mixed martial arts, things like that, a faint is a tactic used to distract your opponent. You act like you're going to go one well at way and make one move, but then you quickly, once they shift, you turn and go the other way. So let's say I pretend like I'm going to punch my opponent in their stomach and do a gut punch. I act like I'm going to do that really quickly. They move to that side and expose their face and then really quickly after the feint I am able to deliver a headshot to the face. That was a feint maneuver. And so what God does is he creates a feint. Why does God need to do that? Well remember those spiritual beings that God designated from his divine counsel to rule and reign over the planet. They didn't want to give up their place. They didn't want to lose their territory. And so God has to pull a feint to bring his kingdom. Let's look at what happens. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16 to talk about this. In Matthew 16, we see that they are in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But while they're there, Peter makes this declaration. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they say, oh, you're John the Baptist, you're Elijah returned, all this stuff. And then Jesus says, but who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, they understood how sonship worked. They understood that Jesus was not literally the byproduct of God the Father with a human being, that God the Father did not come down from heaven and have physical intercourse with Mary. That's not what happened. To be the son of, on heavenly terms, means that you came out of, that you are connected to, that you are unique, that Jesus is a heavenly being in an earthly being's body, that he is literally God in skin. That that, that the God of the universe who spoke everything into creation is present in Jesus. That's why Jesus told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus tells Peter, he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, most of the time we get messed up with this. Because we say that it's the the declaration of Peter that the church is built on. And that is true. But literally, Jesus is telling Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. You are going to be the key leader for the early church. And we know Peter was. Were there many leaders? Yes. But Peter was the key leader to connect the Jews and the Gentiles together. And so he tells the church them this, and about his church, he says, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now that's the NLT, the New Living Translation. That's usually my preferred translation because it's a good balance of easy to read and trustworthy translation. But that phrase powers of hell is not actually what it says in the Greek. Look at the NIV. It gives us a better clue. It says, I say that you are, tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Why would Jesus refer to the gates of Hades? Well, in Caesarea Philippi, there is a place called the gates of Hades, and the ancients believed, the ancient civilizations believed this area was literally 
the entrance to the underworld. The ancient people in cosmic geography believed that the heavens where the gods lived and earth was where human beings lived. And under the earth, beneath the earth, is where spiritual beings go when they die. That when a person dies, their spirits go under the earth. That's why all of the ancient Mesopotamian cultures believed that, that the resting place of the dead was under the ground. Yes, you bury the bodies under the ground, but they believed literally inside the earth is where spirits went. They believed that's where the angels who rebelled were trapped in Tartarus, right, underneath the earth. In what they called Abraham's bosom, you know, the, 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 or Sheol, the grave. And so they believed literally that Caesarea Philippi was where the entrance to the underworld was. It was called the Gates of Hades. This is a picture of it. And there was a great rock in front of Caesarea Philippi. And most scholars believe that that rock is where Jesus was teaching the disciples. Why would he say that to them? That Not only are they looking at the gates of Hades, that rock was where the ancients believed that the gods came down from the mountain behind them. And that that mountain is called Mount Hermon. And so in this place, Jesus is saying all of the powers of the underworld, all the powers of darkness will not prevail against it. Well, guess what that means? That means the powers of darkness do not want the church to happen. They're going to fight against it. And Jesus says they can't withstand it. The, the Greek actually says the, 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 the gates of Hades and the, the power of the gates of Hades will not be able to withstand God's church. That means that the, the church is going to overpower them. Why does that matter? Because on Mount Hermon, the Mesopotamian cultures, the Canaanite cultures, all believed that the Baals came down to earth on Mount Hermon. Jesus actually tells his disciples later not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. He tells them that. When the disciples are up on Mount Hermon, Peter, James, and John go up and Jesus shows them his glory. Why would Jesus do that? Why would he transfigure himself there? Because on Mount Hermon was where the spiritual beings came down from the heavens to come down and have physical, intimate relationships with human beings. That's where those stories came from. Jesus goes back to the place where evil was done, and he reclaims it for his kingdom. And he puts the spiritual world on notice, but he tells the disciples not to tell anyone. Why would Jesus tell his followers not to tell anyone he was the Messiah? Because what we have to remember is that the heavenly beings are limited. Now, are they powerful? Absolutely. Are they knowledgeable? For sure. They're wise. They've lived for thousands of years. But they're still not equal to God. Lucifer, in all of his glory and power, is not equal to Yahweh. He wants people to think he is, but he's not. He's not omniscient and all-knowing. He's not omnipresent everywhere. He's not omnipotent, all-powerful. He is limited. Now, is he more powerful than a human being? For sure. Does he have power over the planet Earth and, and death? Yes, God allowed him to have that. But Jesus comes and takes it back. That's why in the book of Revelation, we see that Jesus has two keys. He says, I have the keys to Hades, the underworld, and the key to death. He took those keys back from Lucifer, who we call Satan. God does not want those heavenly beings, those spiritual beings, to know his plan. He wants them to believe that his kingdom is an earthly kingdom. So chapter 4 is the plan. Chapter 5 is the kingdom. You see, these spiritual beings believe that if Jesus is not allowed to set up an earthly kingdom, they won't lose their power over earthly kingdoms. They did not want there to be a king forever through the Messiah on the throne of David because Jesus was from the line of David. And they thought if we can kill this Messiah, then God's plan will be upset. That's why Jesus told his disciples numerous times, don't tell anyone who I am. He told the demons, the evil spirits that he cast out of human beings, he said, don't you tell people either. He silenced them. Why? He did not want the pagan gods that were under judgment who wanted to preserve their place. That's what the kingdom they thought was about. But the kingdom was actually about something greater. Look at John chapter 19. We see this familiar passage. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And, he said, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. If it was his mission to die. 
but he did not want anyone else to know that. Even he took his disciples in secret and told them the plan. But he didn't say it publicly. He didn't tell people publicly, hey, I am seeking something greater than an earthly kingdom. Because he did not want the spiritual beings that were in charge, the Elohim, to know what his plan was. Verse 29, a jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus told his followers earlier that he did not let anyone take his life from him. No one could do that. He said, I give up my life willingly. He said, I lay my down, life down willingly, and I will take it up again. Jesus is God. Not lowercase g God, capital G, Yahweh, the one true God, creator God. The scriptures say all of creation is held together in Jesus. And I love this, that we usually misunderstand this idea when Jesus says it is finished. We think that he's saying I am finished. Look at what Dr. Tony Evans says. He says Jesus didn't say I am finished. He said it is finished. He was just getting started. You see, Jesus had his eyes set on a greater mission than just setting up a single earthly kingdom. The promised land, the original nation of Israel, would fit inside the state of Texas. Depending on the size you measure, where they may even fit inside the state of Georgia. It's not a big territory. God was interested in something greater than one single piece of land. This is why his mission mattered. He said, it is finished. The mission was completed. And he said, and my daughter Evan said, Jesus was just getting started. Well, how was he just getting started? The last chapter of the great story of God's love story for us is the finale. Jesus pulled off the greatest feint, the greatest, you know, misconfusion, the greatest misunderstanding in all of history. He convinced the heavenly beings it was about a physical territory, but it was greater than that. There was a mysterious plan. And God brought it to completion when he died on the cross. One of the things that we misunderstand when we talk about the work of atonement is we think that, that God had to punish Jesus. That, that Like Abraham sacrificing Isaac, that a father had to kill his son. That's not what's going on here. God is laying down his own life because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are three parts of the same being. Jesus laid his life down willingly. For people and brought the finale. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 6. And once again, this is something we don't talk about. Look at what he said. As I wrote, as I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. Paul said that God told me what this mysterious plan is. He says this, as you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. What is the plan? He says this, God did not reveal it to previous generations. It was kept a mystery. Why was it hidden? Because God did not want the pagan gods, the Elohim in charge of the physical world, to know it. Because if they would have known that Jesus dying on the cross was actually accomplishing the mission, they never would have allowed him to do that. They didn't understand. Had Satan truly understood that Jesus was not being defeated on the cross, he was being victorious on the cross, he never would have sent him there. He never would have orchestrated everything to happen that way. We see in the scripture that Satan entered into Judas to cause Judas to betray Jesus. Satan wanted Jesus put to death. Because Satan thought, Lucifer, Satan, same thing, thought that if Jesus was put to a physical death, then the plan would be ruined, but he didn't realize what the real plan was. It was a feint. It says, now, by his spirit, he, God, has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And Paul writes this, this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news, the gospel, share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. One of the great misunderstandings that even the modern Christian church in America and even throughout the world has fallen victim to is this idea that Israel is God's chosen people even to this day. That, they, that nothing bad can happen to Israel because God's got to protect them. They're his chosen people. No, not anymore. 
they were until the kingdom came. And now, according to the scriptures, Jew and Gentiles who believe in the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. It was not about one single nation. That one single nation was used to bring the whole world back to God. It says both of them are the same body. And both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Jesus Christ. Now, what is a blessing? Now, is getting a, a bonus a blessing? Sure. Having a nice house, that's a blessing. But that's not in a the Jewish culture. That's not what they understood a blessing to be. A blessing to an ancient Jewish person was to have someone speak favorably of you. If they would say, hey, bless you. That means I'm speaking well of you, that they would speak well of you in public. In the gates where all the elders are, to bless someone means to speak well of them. And he's saying that, that God speaks well of us now. We're no longer God's enemies. We are his family. And God declares us righteous and says we are part of his family now. By God's grace and mighty power, Paul says, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. He says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. Why would God want to keep it secret? Because he was trying to keep the Elohim, the divine council in charge of the world from knowing it. Had they known the plan, the real plan, they never would have allowed Jesus to be put to death. But they thought they were winning. They thought they were victorious until Jesus took the keys from them. And what's really interesting, if you read the book of Revelation, there's a divine council around God's throne. But it's not heavenly beings. It's human beings. There are 24 elders that surround God's throne and they wear crowns. They are 24 rulers. Only rulers wear crowns. And God gives crowns to human beings to once again rule over the earth again. And God sets it all right. And this is the big truth that I want all of you to understand that listen to this, that the, all of the Bible points to this. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. Everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, I'm not a Jewish person. I wasn't born into a Jewish family. So that makes me a Gentile. And I'm so thankful and so excited that I get to be part of the family. That Jesus came to make a way for everyone to come into the family. And he does that through his resurrection. He is the resurrected king. And so he resurrects me and you and gives us a new life. When you die and are resurrected, you are born again in a new life. Look at what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, anyone, Jew and Gentile alike, becomes a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. You and I now have a new life in Christ. He says, and all of this is a gift. What a beautiful gift from God who brought us back to himself. How? Through Christ. That's why we sing that worship song. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that's who you are. That worship song Michael W. Smith beautifully penned. I believe God gave him that to give us a worship song to him. To say, look, God, you are the way maker. You made a way for us to come home. That's why God tells, Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son, that none of us are too far gone to come back home. That when the son came to his senses, he went back home. That when we come to our senses and we see what the world really is and how the world really works, we can say, okay, God, you made a way. And it's a gift. So the resurrected king is resurrecting me. Why did I take time to tell you the great love story of God, the greatest story never told? Because I we get to tell other people about what God is doing. So what is the homework that I'm going to give you? What are we called to do, you and me? Here's our feet to faith. Number one, we got to learn the story. we got to learn it. God's great love story is that he works through history to accomplish his purposes. History is his purposes. And he partners with people to do it. God wants everyone to come back home. Jew and Gentile, he wants everybody to be part of his family. And that only happens when we give our life to Jesus. A person is not part of God's family by their birth. 
being born to a Christian family or a Jewish family doesn't automatically make you a Christ follower. It doesn't automatically make you part of God's family. God wants to put all things right. If you read the book of Revelation, at the end, there's a new heaven and a new earth God is going to create where he makes his home among his people again. And I love that John recognizes there's no temple there because people won't have to go to a specific place. God will already be in the heavens and the earth with his people. There will no longer be a barrier of sin that separates us. We've got to learn this beautiful love story. Number two, we've got to tell the story. One of the reasons why, the greatest reasons why people don't know this stuff that I just showed to you is because we don't talk about it. We're so caught up in making converts. We're not making disciples. And the, the world is so excited to hear about spiritual things now. 77% of people in the world today want to talk about spiritual things. They desire it. They long for it. And we need to tell the story. But here's the most important part. If I learn the story and tell the story, but I don't live the story, people don't care. People know the Bible's available to them. People know the church is open to them. People know the information is at a fingertips, just a couple of clicks away. But the reason why they don't care is an old phrase. It's a silly phrase. It's a cheesy phrase, but it's a true phrase. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. People don't care that you know until they know that you care. And that is true of all of us. And we've got to live the story out. This stuff matters. There is evil in the world seeking to claim this planet, but Jesus overcame them and he holds the keys and he delegates authority. Keys represent authority. And he delegates his authority to us so we can go into the world and share the gospel. The word gospel means good news. It is good news that everybody can be part of God's family. And he does that by resurrecting us. The resurrected king is resurrecting you and me. So I hope as you listen to God's great love story, the, the biblical worldview of understanding what the Bible teaches overall. Are there specific things we can get into the weeds about baptism and salvation and the Holy Spirit and all these things, communion and, and speaking in tongues and miracles, all of these things? Yes, we can get in the weeds about that. And, that, and we should. I love that stuff. But the big picture all of these little things put together is that God loves you and he wants you and me to come home to be part of his family. And we need to tell people about that. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to email me, reach out to me. Thank you for spending time with me today. I'm so honored that you chose to connect with this or any other material here on this channel. But if you need help, man, I'm, I'm right here. Email me, call me, text me. I want to help any way I can. So once again, my name is James Johnson, and I'm so, so thankful that you watched this video. I pray it blesses you. I pray that God moves mightily in your life. And I pray more than that, that this great love story makes the Bible and the world make more sense to you so that we can go into the world and make disciples as Jesus calls us to. Thank you for joining me today. Be blessed.